Welcome to the discussion we're going to have about stored procedures and functions. Now, if you are watching this video, I'm going to assume that you've already been introduced to PL SQL. And if you haven't, make sure you go watch that video that we've already recorded on that. But PL SQL, uh, you can run it in an anonymous sense. So that's where you actually go through and uh, create PL SQL and run it, uh, you know, in a tool like this, like SQL Developer. But you can also take um, PL SQL or procedural language and you can put it into kind of a block of code that gets saved on the database. And if you are, depending on uh, how you're going to you know, use that code, you could put it into one of two things, a stored procedure or a function. So you'll notice some of the code here that's happening in this begin clause. And if I go and just look right here at this code, you'll notice that it's a uh, pretty standard PL SQL. It has a begin uh, chunk of code, it has the exception, and it ends with, a, uh, with the end clause, semicolon, and a slash. Now you'll notice here in this code, it's actually doing an update on the invoices. It's gonna go set the credit total equal to some variable. And we don't, so but it's not actually putting in a specific amount, it's actually setting it to a variable, where the invoice number equals some variable. So what, uh, where do we get these variables from? Well, that's where uh, the stored procedure becomes really helpful. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create a procedure and we're gonna give it a name and we're gonna feed in a couple of different variables when we actually call this code. We're gonna feed in specific numbers. And so what we're doing is we're creating a procedure, giving it a name, telling it what in, uh, inputs we're gonna be part of that, as the following PL SQL code. And as we've used it, you know, multiple times before, you know, you've always like, you we played around with create table as, and you would write some select statement here, you know, uh, where you would actually, you know, use this keyword and then say as this code here. Um, so it's very similar to that. Now, uh, I'm gonna remove just this one piece of code where it says or replace. I'm gonna show you something because I remember when people were creating tables the first time uh, using DDL that they would go and create the vendors table or something and then they would run that again and they'd get this error message that said, hey, there's already an object that exists. Well, let me show you what this is gonna do. We're gonna run this. I'm just gonna hit control enter here and it's gonna run everything between the slash and the create. And what it has done is it's created a procedure and if we go over here to the area where we actually store uh, things like our tables, you'll actually see that we've now created a piece of code. And keep in mind, we are logged into the server. And so that means just like these tables are sitting out on the server, this procedure is now sitting on the server. And just like we can send a SQL query to the server and say, hey, go pull this data from this table uh, and pass back that data, we can call this procedure. And when I say call, I mean we can go send a command to the server and say execute this procedure. Now, um, and so if we open this code up, you'll see that it requires two inputs, uh, the invoice number parameter and the credit total parameter. You go here and look at it, you'll see uh, the code that we actually just uh, created. Um, now, I'm gonna back up for a second and make a note of something. If I go here and if I run this code and say create procedure, if I run it again, I'm actually gonna get the error that you should get, which is, hey, there's already something named that. There's an existing object named that. Now, here's the cool part about procedures is that we can actually use this uh, keyword, uh, create or replace. And what that means is we will create the procedure or if it already exists, replace the procedure with uh, whatever version of, co of code is here. So it's like an overwrite. And so we will, uh, whatever that, you know, is said here, right? If I, if I type in some additional code here, um, I don't know, I'm just making something up here, um, you know, because we can take, put in SQL here. I could go in here and run this again. I don't even know if I can do an order by, I guess you wouldn't order by on a, on an update statement. It's kind of a dumb example. Um, let's do this. Let's just change something in this code and say, okay, here we go. Now I could run this and it would, uh, have no problem, uh, because, and, and, and it would actually overwrite that code. So that's what the or replace is. It's kind of a cool little feature where you can, uh, just go in and, um, uh, overwrite and you don't have to drop the procedure and recreate it. Now, if you do want to know, if you if you had to guess how do you drop a procedure, it's just like drop table whatever or drop index whatever. You just drop 
procedure, whatever the name of that procedure is. And if you run that here, you will, uh, if I run just this part of the code, the procedure of this was dropped. I can refresh and you'll see here that it is gone. And if I want to recreate it, and notice here I could rerun this again because it's just going to replace the code that's there. Uh, so if I can refresh here, there it is. There's my procedure. Now I don't have any functions out here, but I'll make some here in a second. So let's talk about what this procedure is doing. So we have a procedure called update invoice credit total. And in this uh, procedure, we're feeding in a couple of variables um, and, or inputs. What that means is later on when we have to call this code, we have to give it the inputs that we've defined. Um, so if you think about like, for example, this update uh, invoice credit total, what we're doing is we're gonna say, here's an invoice number and here's a credit total amount. Um, and those uh, can be referred to down here in the SQL within the procedural code. So we could run this update invoices, set credit total equal to the credit total parameter. So whatever the credit total we feed in, it will update it to that and it will do it for the invoice number that matches the invoice number we fed in. So uh, effectively, this is very much the same. If I were to, to call this code right here, let's say, I, and I'll just run it for a second, you'll see that the call was completed. What it did is it actually fed these two variables here into this procedure and it ran this code and it updated uh, this invoice here to 200 for that credit total. Um, the remaining code you'll probably recognize, it actually commits that change. If there are any errors, it will actually roll back and not commit those changes. And then that's it. So if I run this select statement here for the invoice number and credit total for this invoice, you'll notice here that it actually does have a credit total of 200 now. If I were to change this to something else like 400 and run it again, oh, sorry, let's run this and then run this query, you'll see now it's 400. And um, and let's just say, well, let's just do something a little crazy here. Let's just go call the code. Let's just say, hey, go run this uh, you know, procedure. It's gonna say, hey, there's either the wrong number or the type of arguments, uh, meaning that you can't run this code and say, hey, go update invoice credit total and not tell it what invoice to go update it for or what to credit total to set it to. So. When you have this number of uh, when you have this number of inputs, you have to make sure you pass in those inputs. Um, otherwise, this code's not going to run. And there are other ways you can make a call, right? So let's just look at all the ways you can call a uh, a procedure. One is you can use the call procedure and feed in the you know the variables or the values that you want to feed in. So we can run this and uh, oh, let's try that again. There we go, so the call was completed. Uh, so that means it updated this invoice credit total to 400. Uh, you can also put in a um, procedure um, within a, uh, you can call a procedure within PL SQL. So you'll notice here PL SQL, all that was required is just a begin and end statement with a slash. And the only difference here is that you don't have to use the call within the PL SQL. Uh, so you only have to use call if you're calling, if you're actually calling that procedure within you know, something like SQL Developer. Uh, but if you want to put it in PL SQL, you just give the name of the procedure and tell it to run. Uh, here we actually just updated the credit total to 300, and there it is. And if you want to feed in specific um, parameters, but you want to do it, let's say, in a different order, like for example, if we were to do this in this order, right, like this, this would not work because it's going to feed 300 in where it's expecting a var car, so there is no invoice number 300, and it's not gonna be able to update the credit total to a string like this. So you can do it out of order though if you want, and you can do that by actually putting in the name of the parameter that's up here. So you can say this parameter, um, and oddly enough, you can set it equal to with this arrow um, operator, this equals arrow. So you can say credit to, uh, uh, you can say credit total parameter equals this invoice uh, number parameter equals this. So you can use the name of the parameter if you want to do it out of order. And again, if I run this, we're going to set the credit total equal to uh, 100. 
Let's run it one more time. There it is at 100. I can go in here and set it to zero. And now it's zero. So that is how you create a store procedure. It kind of walks you through the syntax and that is how you call a store procedure. You call it from the actual command line. You can call it with MPL SQL and you can actually call it with MPL SQL if you specify, uh, you can do that based on the order of the parameters or you can do it based on the actual names. Let's talk about how you would code an optional parameter. So in some cases, you may want to default a credit total parameter to a certain value. Um, let's actually do something like this. Let's, let's go set this back to, uh, I think we earlier we set it to zero. I'm gonna put it back to 100 and I'm gonna run this, make sure it's there. Okay, cool. All right, so now in this procedure, what we have is it's the same procedure, so we can just run the create or replace and it's just gonna overwrite that. And if you refresh, you'll see, there it is. Uh, and I can see now the only difference that I'm doing here is I'm adding a default value. And so this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you. You've seen this syntax before. So we can set a default value, but I'm gonna actually set a default value of zero. And the reason I want to do that is that maybe when I am um, doing an update of a credit total amount, I just the default value is always going to be zero for the credit total. Um, to me, that makes more business sense that we're not going to just give people credit until they've earned it. So the default is zero. Uh, so this is actually the exact same code. Uh, but now you'll notice here, um, let's say we run this and uh, okay, we've updated it. Um, so we called the procedure and we've set the credit total equal to 200. Now watch what will happen here. What if I don't feed in a value for the credit total? Well, it's actually not going to throw a problem for you because um, if there is no value fed in for that second parameter, it will just default it to uh, whatever the default is. So let's, uh, let's go back here. Oh, hold on. Let's, let's get this to run. Yeah, there we go. Default is zero. Maybe it didn't compile. All right, so if I go back here and I check this, all right, it's 100. Now I'm going to go ahead and just um, call this. And without feeding in a value, there we go. So what it did was, is I gave it the one input parameter that it needed, which is this was it right here. It was required. This one I didn't give it, but it defaulted it to zero. And that's why we get the zero here. So if you want to code in an optional parameter, you can actually set in your procedural code a, a hard-coded or a default value for your procedure um, for certain parameters. Okay, let's run back. Let's run this again. Let's actually put in a zero. And, and there we go, we have a zero. All right, let's talk about how you would raise an error. Um, just so you're aware, like you know you can do this in PL SQL, we can do this also in a procedure. And so what we can do is we can kind of add in an additional logic here. So it's the same code, but now what we're doing is we're adding in this code and I'm gonna give you two different versions of this error, but basically it's gonna say, hey, if the credit total parameter is less than zero, which we wouldn't wanna give somebody a negative $100 credit, um, it'll throw a value error. So what we do here is it just, we use this key term called raise and in this case, we're just gonna say raise a value error. And value error is just a standard default error. And basically what will happen is if you raise a value error, um, it's kind of this catch all, like if you, if you use this key term here, uh, this syntax, it's just going to throw an error message and it's gonna stop the code from running any further. So it's gonna stop before it gets to this um, update statement. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, now, again, it's not actually running the code. It, uh, that wasn't clear. All that's doing is recompiling and um, updating this version of the uh, code that's stored on the server. So you see now we have the if statement here. So let's go through and now let's um, let's try to do something like this. Let's first let's run the this run the statement. You'll notice it runs just fine, no errors. But what if we try to feed in a negative credit total? So you'll notice here we get this pretty vicious looking error and it says you know, there was some kind of uh, numeric or value error. Um, and it even you know, told us what line it was at. Um, 
But let's do this. Now let's take this general catch-all error, this value error, and let's raise what we call an application error. So we can raise an application error and we can actually give it a number uh, and we can give it a name uh, with a description, uh, not a name, a description, say credit total may not be negative. So let's recompile this. And now let's go back and let's run this code again. Actually, let me hit the eraser here and let's run it one more time. Now when we get this, it actually will feed in, it'll tell us, hey, this call just happened. And the error, um, what we see here, is this is the error that we actually defined. 2001, we gave it a custom uh, number. And, uh, and we say credit total may not be negative. And so now we actually get uh, our own custom error here. Um, and uh, again, if you wanted to call that, um, you know, if you wanted to call this um, procedure and feed in a negative value, you could do that in PL SQL and it would feed back this error message that you want. Uh, I'm not going to get so hung up on the syntax of the error messages, but more just getting you used to the idea that, hey, we can handle errors uh, in the exception block. And um, so what we're doing is in the procedural code, we're saying, hey, let's raise this specific type of error. And uh, and so that way, if the code fails, the procedure, if it doesn't have if it doesn't have the ability to move forward, it'll at least return an error message. And then so when we call this procedure, It'll say, hey, if this procedure gives us or, you know, if this anything has an error here, we can actually go in and, and handle that error here and say what to do. So in this next example, I'm going to show you exactly how a procedure can be used to insert data, but also to, to validate some of the data to check that it's good. So we're gonna run and create this procedure called insert invoice. Um, and procedure in, insert invoice was compiled. Let's go back here and run this again. Sometimes we have to close this. There we go, there's insert invoice. Now, if we, let's take a look at this, in, uh, this code. Um, it's got a lot of code in it, but uh, it's not that overwhelming uh, when you really break it down. So the first thing to note is that um, it is going to uh, first uh, capture, um, you know, certain inputs that it's going to need. Um, so for example, um, it's going to need a vendor ID. Like if we are going to insert an invoice for someone, we got to know the vendor ID we're inserting for. And you'll notice this uh, percentage type. Um, that means that we want to basically uh, set this variable equal to the data type of the vendor ID on the invoice table. And we've seen this syntax before. Um, you could also just say, hey, it's, you know, it's a number. Uh, but this is a way to ensure that the data type that we are allowing when we feed it in here in this procedure matches the data type on our table. So that way, for some reason, if there was a different data type, like if the vendor ID was a number, but we're feeding in letters, uh, we just want to say, hey, you know, these have to be the same data type. So we're going to feed in these other required fields, invoice number, uh, date, total. Um, the payment total and credit total, they're actually going to be optional. And we know that because they're just going to default to zero if nobody feeds in something to this procedure for this. Um, the other values here, terms ID, invoice due date, these are actually all going to default to null unless when we're calling it, we'll feed in that information. Now, um, the um, the other uh, things that you so these are just defining the actual inputs right here under the as we will actually um, we have this one area that we were used to using on PLC we'll call declare well declare does not exist in a procedure so what you do is when you say as um, if you are going to declare any variables you do that right here before the begin. And so here we're going to declare some variables that we'll need to use, such as uh, the invoice ID, terms ID, uh, and we'll see where these get used later. Uh, for now, just focus on the understanding that we have inputs, we have variables. So as the code begins um, and runs, assuming that we are going to feed in, um, you know, let's say uh, all the things that we are required to do. So we would have to feed in at least a vendor ID, an invoice number, a date, and a total. Um, the rest of these things would default. Um, if we've fed in those things, then uh, here's what's going to happen. 
The first thing it's going to do is it's going to check that the invoice total parameter is not less than zero. Because if it is less than zero, it's going to raise an error and stop this whole piece of code. So that would make sense, right? We don't want an invoice total being less than zero. So that's the first thing. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to go select the invoice sequence ID sequence um, next value into this variable that we've already defined. So we're going to go get what is the um, you know the um, uh, sequences next value. And if I actually open this, you know, space this code out a little bit, it actually makes a little bit more sense. We actually, uh, we know this code, right? We've seen this where we go and say, hey, select this next value into this variable. Uh, and we use the dual table here just so that we can, um, you know, we don't actually need to select it from a specific table. So we'll say select from dual into this. Uh, and we'll actually capture that next sequence ID and we'll save it in this variable and that will come in handy later on where we're inserting that uh, the next thing here is you know if this is null which it's right now um, you know if nobody fed anything in it's going to default to null so here it's just doing a check it looks like it's saying hey if this is null go select the default terms ID into vendors where the vendor ID equals the vendor ID that we've already fed in now, don't get overwhelmed by this code because once we, uh, you know, again, if you were to think about this logically, you would say, hey, let's create a procedure that's going to go insert an invoice. You know, you would know there's certain values you need to cap, you know, feed in, some that you could just default. Um, but let's just take it step by step. So here it's just saying, hey, if this is null, I want to go select this default term, which every vendor has a default term. Um, so it's going to go look up that vendor. Um, so it would say, hey, what? select the default term for that vendor where the vendor ID equals the vendor we just fed in. And it's going to go save that here in the terms ID variable. Um, otherwise, um, if, vendor, if this terms ID is not null, then what it's going to do, it's going to go ahead and grab the terms ID that we fed in. So this way, this is pretty dynamic. If it is null, it's going to go look it up. If it's not null, uh, it's just going to take the value that we fed in. And this last check that's happening here is basically another check. It's saying, hey, if the invoice due date is null, then go select the terms due date. So it's, it's very similar to this code here. Um, for me, I like to, to space this all out on the same line so I can just understand what the heck's going on, uh, on, on different lines, I mean. Um, and so here, I would, it would uh, you know, select the, uh, the, this term into this variable here um from the terms where the term id equals this term variable and from there it's going to set the invoice due date equal to whatever the invoice due date parameter is that was fed in plus the terms due date so this is basically saying that the due date is going to be equal to whatever their their due date number of due days plus the invoice date um, otherwise they just set it equal to whatever the due date was fed in. All right, so basically, let's take a step back and look over this one more time. This code is going to feed in some variables that are required. It will feed in some others uh, that are optional if they, if, if, uh, if they are fed in. Um, we've declared some variables that will get used later on down in here. If you ever just click on this, it'll show you, show you where they're being used. And then we're gonna go through this. All this code here is just basically checking the inputs. So it's checking this uh, invoice total. It's checking the terms parameter that we fed in. It's uh, checking the invoice due date parameter. It, you notice it's not checking the vendor ID or the invoice number because there's really nothing to check there. Like we assume that those numbers, whatever they're gonna be fed in, as long as they're the right data type, they're fine. And then once it's going to do all that, it's basically going to insert into invoices the following values. It's going to insert the invoice ID that we've gone and looked up. It's going to insert the vendor ID parameter, which we have been fed in. It's going to insert the, insert the vendor number parameter that we fed in, the invoice date parameter that we fed in, the invoice total parameter that we fed in. And then it's going to feed in the payment total, which will either default to zero or it has been fed in. It's going to de insert the credit total amount if it's not a default of zero. Same thing for terms, due date, and payment date parameter. It's going to feed in all of these things. Um, 
and it's just going to run this insert statement. It's going to insert into invoices the following values. So let's go back here. And let's uh, let's see. We've already run this uh, pr uh, procedure, so now let's go run it. Let's uh, let's go call the insert invoice. We're going to feed in again only four things are required: the vendor ID, the invoice number, the invoice date, and the total. The rest of these values actually uh, we could feed in. You know, a zero. We could feed in null. Um, so we're just going to run this thing here. Let's just run this guy, and it ran fine. Um, let's, uh, let's see here. Why is it running again? Oh, it's actually going to run. So if we run this again, let's see what happens here. So notice that it ran just fine. And it's what the difference here is that we didn't feed in a payment date parameter. Uh, and so it's going to default that for us to null here. We actually fed in a hard code null. Um, let's run in this, run this one more time. Um, and what this is doing every time it's going to go insert a new invoice ID for us for this vendor uh, Notice here. I'm only feeding in the four required parameters So it's gonna set all those other parameters to default, right? I'm only feeding in these four the rest of these are going to default All right, so let's go select star from uh, Invoices where the invoice ID is greater than this. So here are the three invoices. We just entered notice that in one we actually specified null the other way we didn't, so it defaulted to null, which is what that was set to do in the procedure. Here, you'll notice we actually just fed the first four in. So if we say, hey, go call the insert invoice, feed in the vendor, the invoice number, the invoice date, and the total, and notice that it went and ran that, and this is the actual line it fed in, this last one. Now, if I went and ran this code here, um, and I fed in a negative invoice total, that is going to fail, and that is because here, if the invoice total is less than zero, it's going to raise a value error. And it actually did do that. It raised a, an error and it said, hey, you can't do that. So I'm just going to delete these here. And they are gone now. If I ran this again, by the way, you'll notice that it's 118 probably. Yep. Because we're just calling the next value in that sequence. So this procedure uh pretty awesome not as complex as it seems when you look through it and and this is basically if we said if we were thinking about an application for example and we want to have our application uh, we feed in on a gui uh, let's say we fed in the following things like um you know so you know we could even default this um and set it equal to um, you know, uh, a, a, uh, a variable that would be like a substitution variable. But let's say that we even had like a GUI that collected this following information here. We could have a screen or a GUI, um, you know, and, and let me just, you know, play around here for a second. Think about it like this. Um, if we were to do this here. Yeah, never mind. Well, what I was going to try to take a minute and just prototype like a little screen, but imagine you have a GUI that has four fields on it. And through the GUI, we, we capture these four parameters. And when we hit save, uh, that save button, what it does is then goes and it calls this invoice number and it feeds in the values, uh, this insert invoice procedure. And it actually goes and feeds in these values. And runs the procedure and call you know runs the procedure. The procedure then runs on the database and does the insert and then passes back to the screen and says, "Hey, this worked." Um, that is something that you actually um, you know could do. So pretty cool. Um, you don't always build applications like this where you build your insert logic and update logic on the actual database. Some people do. Some people don't. Um, it's not always necessarily the best practice to do it on one side or the other, but what we would probably suggest is if you have very good front end development skills, you're probably going to put a lot of that business logic and all this, like this stuff here that we're doing, you're going to put it on the application side. If you have really good database skills, you might put your, you know, your complexity on the database side. Really depends on your resources that you have.
Okay, in this next one, we're going to walk through functions. And so functions are pretty awesome. Uh, you use them a lot in websites and building applications. And they are, um, uh, they're something you've already used before. But uh, so, for example, we've used something like the sysdate function, right? And you've, uh, you've even used something like the sum function. Um, these are functions. Now we're going to define our own functions. So we're actually going to use the creator place function and we're going to create a function called get vendor ID. And basically the vendor ID function requires one input, which is the name, uh, this vendor name parameter, which is a bar car. And what it's going to end up doing is there's this one last piece here that you've, uh, you know, it's going to be slightly different. It's this return, um, and the data type. So what a procedure will have the ability to do is to update, insert and delete data. Functions can't do that. Functions are always going to return a value. So when you run the function, it's going to return something to you. And that shouldn't be so, you know, strange if you think about it. For example, if you, you know, use the select sysdate uh, from dual, right? So what we're doing here is we're running the, this is actually a function and we're running this function called sysdate. And when we run it, we actually call that function and it returns a value to us, returns the current value. If I were to, um, let's say, you know, select the, um, you know, invoice uh, total from invoices, if this is actually right. All right, here we go. If I were to run the sum function, sum function, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed in a bunch of values and what it's gonna do is it's gonna spit back a value to me. So I pass in something and I get something back. That's what a function is there to do. So in this one, we're actually going to feed in this thing called the vendor name parameter. It's a bar car and we're going to return a number. And that will make sense when we get further along down here. We're going to end up using this vendor ID variable, uh, which is also number. And so let's see where it's all going to get used. So what we're doing is we're selecting a vendor ID into this variable here. And we'll need to have a variable because when we, you know, when we do return that number, we're going to return it in a variable. We're going to say, you know, and we'll show, we'll show what we mean here. So we're going to select the vendor ID. Uh, let's just take this out for a second. Select vendor ID from vendors where the vendor name equals the vendor name that we type in and feed into this uh, procedure. So we're going to basically go look up the uh, vendor name of the vendor name we, we mentioned here in the vendor table. And we're going to select their vendor ID and save it in this variable. And then we're going to return that variable. So let's run this function. Uh, sorry, let's compile the functions. We're not running it. Uh, so what we mean is I'm, I've just basically run the code to create this uh, function. And now what I can do is I can actually run this function one of two ways. One is I could, uh, let's run it a simple way actually. Let's run a select uh, so here's the get vendor ID function I'm gonna run this one first because this one is actually easier um, and I'm gonna go select the get vendor ID function and I'm gonna feed in one variable which is a vendor name if I run this it's actually going to I'm gonna feed in this vendor name and it's gonna spit back uh, the ID and so if, let's think about how, how I did that I, I gave it the vendor a name and what it did is it selected the vendor ID from vendors where the vendor name equals the vendor name I fed it. And it saves that vendor ID in this variable. And at the very end of this function, it returns it. So uh, let's try doing this. Let's actually go and run a select star from vendors to get another vendor name to test. All right, let's grab job track, it's vendor ID four. Let's run this. Boom, it's vendor four. And you can actually use that function in other places. So let's say we want to select uh, this information from invoices where the vendor ID equals the vendor ID of uh, IBM. So we can actually feed it in here as a function. And what this is doing, um, is that we're actually saying, go give me this information from invoices where the vendor ID equals, and then we can actually replace, uh, instead of actually feeding the value, we can just say, hey, where this, you know, the get ID uh, vendor ID function 
feed in this name and it will actually run this function and this is no different than just running the function and it will actually do this first and then it just uh, saves that and it's the same as running this right here. So um, what we've done here is, you know, essentially created a function. Um, we've learned how to feed in some inputs and how it gets something back. Um, now note, you don't actually have to get, uh, you don't actually have to feed in a value. Um, here's a piece of code I just want to play around with. It's called get Clint's fave num. It's going to return a number, and you'll notice that it has no uh, inputs. So here, instead of you know there being an input, it's just going to it's going to create something. It's going to return a number, and what it's going to do is it's going to select 34 from the dual table into this favorite num uh, variable that we've created, and it's going to return that. And now, if I want, I can go up here and I can just run get Clint's fave number as Clint's fave number. Um, I can also just say, go get Clint's fave number without the parentheses and it would return it for me. And you may think this sounds a little familiar if you think about it like the sysdate. The sysdate is just a function. And when you call it, it's meant it's gonna run some code that's already saved out here in the Oracle system. And it's gonna spit back the current date. And here, the Clint, uh, get Clint's fave number um, my number, favorite number being 34, Ricky Williams football number. Um, you know, if I say select get Clint's fave number, it's just going to spit back the value 34. Um, I could actually also say, uh, I don't know, just, just because I was thinking about this and I was thinking of that number, I could say, hey, go select star from invoices where vendor ID. This makes no business sense, but again, we could do it. Uh, I know that vendor ID 34 exists. And there it is, vendor ID 34. We can actually use my function that I just created. Again, no business sense, but it's kind of fun. So I'm gonna just quickly show you uh, these last two uh, this these last two functions and then show you how you can put a function within a function and then I'll stop there. So um, in this function, what we have here, I'm gonna go ahead and just compile it. It's called the get balance due. And we're gonna feed in an, I, an invoice ID. And it, what we're gonna to hope to get back is the balance due for that. So what we're simply doing is selecting the invoice total, payment total, minus credit total. Um, and we're gonna select that into the balance due variable. And that's what we're gonna return. Now you may remember this, right? We've already done this like invoice total minus payment minus credit uh, from invoices. Uh, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna go do that specific calculation for the invoice ID that we fed in, and it's gonna save it in this variable, and that's what it's gonna return. So now, if I go in here, and I run this SQL statement here, and I say, select vendor ID, invoice number, um, and also the get balance due for a specific invoice ID, um, and it will, uh, you know, I mean, I could also just go in and feed in 37. I think I could do that. Yeah, that'll work just fine. Um, but in this situation, um, what we're doing is we're actually getting the balance due. Um, actually, that didn't work. So the reason why is that we're saying, let's go select. Um, so this is just like, let's say, doing a count of invoice ID. But here we're doing the get balance due for invoice ID. So, um, so what we're doing is, um, what if I could do, I could feed in this number here. Let's see if this works. Yeah, that works. Uh, sort of, not really, no, it doesn't. So just like we could do a count of, you know, invoice ID, you know, using that count function, we can also do a get balance due, um, for invoice ID. Now the problem is count is going to do a it's an aggregate, so we can't do that. But what we're simply doing is we're we're in, instead of um, you know having the actual balance due, uh, we could have done it like this. Let, let me just go down here and show you like this. We could have done it like this. We could have said vendor ID, invoice number, invoice ID, and the then we could have written this whole thing out. But what we did essentially up here in this is that we actually took all that and we stuck it into a function and have it return in this balance uh, due variable. So what we see here is that we say, hey, go 
pull me this information for this invo for from invoices where the vendor ID equals 37. Well, we can now just say, hey, go pull the same exact information, but we'll replace this here with the get balance due for this invoice ID. Because remember, we got to feed in uh, the specific invoice ID that we are uh, working on. And um, so we run this. And there we go. We have uh, the balance due. Same as if we were to run that, uh, you know, and spell it out. And um, if you uh, think about it, right here we have, you know, get balance due. We could run it by itself and just get the actual balance due for each of these variables. You can actually take a sum of that amount. So we can put a function within a function and get the total. And so just to kind of throw around one thing that this uh, book was showing you is that we could actually do a get sum balance. And what we'll do is we'll actually go and get the sum of the get balance due for an invoice and save it in the sum balance due, uh, due variable and return that. So what it's doing is it's taking a function we've already created. It's now calling that function within another function that we've just compiled. And now what we can do is we can actually say, let's go select invoice vendor ID and the get balance due for this invoice. Here we have it. And the get balance due for a specific vendor ID, which is what this uh, requires. And sure enough, it goes and gets all that information. Um, and if you were to go in here and let's say the, uh, if I were to delete this uh, get balance due and drop it, you'll actually notice that right off the bat, this get some balance now has an error with it. And what that means is, um, it, the reason it has an error is that, hey, I just deleted this function and it's dependent on it because this function here, the get some do, uh, balance due, is a, is a function that relies on another function. I just deleted it. Um, so anyway, this is just the point of showing you this is that we can put functions within functions. So as we create functions, we can use them again as we create more functions and it can do some pretty, you know, you know, cool stuff, right? We can, we can use them in select statements. We can uh, use them in even our where clauses. But if you're going to need to uh, get some information back, um, then we can use the function to go and look something up. So a good example where this would happen in an application is that let's say we have someone log in and we have a kind of a login validation function that takes in a username and a password. Well, then it would go and validate that that username exists, that password is valid, it matches what's in the database, and then it would spit back a response to say, all right, this is Clint, and they are okay, and we can log them in. So um, anyway, so I'll stop there, and I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, you know, after you've played around reading and running the code, post on Piazza, and we'll be happy to help answer.